All right, for today's scripture reading, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. So if you can stand with me, and, and if you have the Pew Bible, it's on page 840. Page A four zero in Mark chapter five. We're going to begin with verse twenty one. We're going to go to verse thirty four. Page A forty. Mark five twenty one. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his knee, at his feet, and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for twelve years and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd, and he said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But a woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, and fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Amen. You may be seated. Father, we thank you for your word, the word that gives life. Help us not simply to understand it, but to, put, uh, to receive it, to put, uh, partake it. It is food, uh, it is to our body. We pray that it will be also to our spirit. So we, not, we do not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I want to begin this way. In the same way food is culture, words are shaped by culture values. In Chinese, for example, the word face, and many of you know the, uh, the words that you're going to be learning some Chinese, by the way, today, okay? <laughs> the word face is not primarily about a bodily feature, but it's almost always a metaphor for social standing face. It's valued about everything on a level that it's hard for outsiders to really imagine. And one Chinese scholar famously said, in China, face is more important than anything you can possibly possess. It has more power than fate and grace, more sacred than the Constitution. Consequently, in our culture, there's a host of idioms concerning face. Besides to lose face and to save face, which are English idioms that borrow directly from Chinese, by the way, there's also mei mianzi, I have no face, meaning I am deeply ashamed. Bu gei mianzi, you don't give me face, which is to say you don't value me. Bu yao lian, literally you don't want face. Well, meaning you have no shame. Look at my face, meaning out of respect for me. That is to keep face to the point of death. There's also longer sayings like which roughly means compared to the value of face, money is as worthless as dirt. Literally, a person needs face like a tree needs bark. And dozen and dozen of others, you get the point. In Asia, face is everything. Your entire existence, consciously or unconsciously, is driven by this idea of face. You are responsible not only, not only for your own face, 
but also the faces of the people around you. It's not an exaggeration to say that nine out of ten seemingly inexplicable, irrational odd social behaviors and other exacerbating idiosyncrasies to Westerners can be perfectly explained once you understand Asians' cultural instincts about face. For them, it's just life. For us, becoming aware of the different values of different cultures is part of learning how to bless our neighbors cross-culturally. It helps us connect. It helps us connect. Now, here's a map of culture put out by Global Mapping International Ministry. The person behind this is missiologist Jason Georges, who wrote the book, The 3D Gospel. He wrote that book to explain the differences of guilt, shame, and fear cultures. Guilt on the map is blue, shame is red, and fear is green. There's not so much green. Now, the darker the color, the higher the value. Now, if you look at the map, one thing you should be able to tell right away is that most people lived in the red area or honor shame cultures, including Russia, the Middle East, India, and almost all Asia and Africa. In fact, about 90% of unreached people groups and more than 65% of the world's population lives in honor shame contexts. And some of them, along with their families, including most recent immigrants, are now our neighbors, right? Now, by the way, these colors are based on relative values. They are based on relative values because all cultures really experience all three elements. And that's kind of a, the, the, the pie diagram is kind of a, 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 a way to visualize that. We all have all three elements just because our country, one country is blue doesn't mean that they don't experience shame. So for example, Italy. Italy is medium blue. It's less Guilt and innocent blue is guilt innocence. So it's less guilt innocence than America, but it's, you know, it's in comparison to China, it, it is light, it's medium blue. And China is light red. But in some ways, though, the Italians, Italian culture is actually closer than Asian culture, than American culture. At least in a way they experience some shame. A while back, Anita sent me a review of Italian comedy. It's a foreign movie. And the movie was about a businessman from Italy who lost everything when his bank account was emptied by a rival. But rather than losing face, this is where we Asians feel his pain, rather than losing face, <clears throat> he decided to lock his entire family in the basement for two weeks so that they could pretend to their neighbors and friends they were away on this lavish vacation, which they couldn't afford. <laughs> now, to keep up with the elaborate scheme, they had to hide in the rat-infested basement, surviving on pickled vegetables, sneaking upstairs, and making commando raids to supermarkets, all without their neighbors knowing. And posting fake family vacation pictures on social media. Now, at first, I thought, well, this is just an over-the-top movie plot. But then, I found this, this one survey. According to that survey, some 3 million Italians fake their holidays. <laughs> of the 3 million, many of them went to extraordinary lengths to keep up their appearances. Two-thirds said that they were research a resort that they were pretending to visit just to fabricate believable stories. Some 24% bought ultraviolet lamps to get a fake tan. 19% took their plans to a neighbor to pretend that they were going away or going out of town. So now I feel like the Italians are a lost tribe of China. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, though, cultures are hard to quantify. So that's not the point of this map. The point here is not to put every culture in a neat box. The point is we need to become aware. There is difference. There are differences. People from an unashamed background tend to value to be beholden to their relationship to the point that the, the, the community defines who they are. It makes sense. Because shame takes place. It occurs in community. So for them, following Jesus, that's not just an individual choice. 
a choice of truth or falsehood, or even a choice of worldview. Rather, it feels more like you are pressuring them to turn their backs on their family, on who they are. And if we're not aware of these blind spots, what we think we are saying and we, what, they, what they are in fact hearing are two very different things. So we need to become aware. Now, if you want to learn more of, of, or, or to have just better, to feel better equipped, I would encourage you to visit unashamed.com. Unashamed.com for more resources. There are lots of resources supporting out by this missions organization. But for my purposes here today, my focus is not on skills, it's not on information. My goal is to show you why Jesus is in fact good news, great news to all of us, including maybe even especially those of us and that neighbor who experiences shame. Now, in our guilt innocence culture, our solution to shame is what I call non conformity. Non conformity. Our salvation is individual self-assertion. To feel empowered by some form of self-affirmation. So for instance, say I'm overweight or I'm again a lot of weight lately. Well, I'm going to talk, talk to myself. It's my body. This is me. What matters is I am beautiful, I am strong, and I'm powerful. Self-assertion. Now, I get a need, I get a need for positive self-image, but I don't think it actually addresses the real problem. I believe only the gospel deals with our true source of shame. Now let me explain. You see, in my experience, when I overcome one shame, on the surface level, it may be the way I look, it may be my weight, it might be my educational accomplishments, as I overcome one shame, another shame immediately take, takes its place. It just doesn't go away. So, for example, you know, I overcome the shame that I didn't make it into Ivy, Ivy League school. Okay, so I'm fine with that now. But then, you know, why am I still single? Is there something wrong with me? And then when I get married, I'm thinking, why does Anita cry all the time? People are going to think you're a bad husband. <laughs> Maybe we should have kids. Then when I have kids, I ask, why are my kids so embarrassingly wild, right? <laughs> People are going to think I'm a bad father. And on and on it goes. I watch a mouse eat my food and did nothing. <laughs> Shame. At some point, I have to wake up. I have to wake up to the painful fact that the problem may be inside, not outside. Maybe something is wrong. It is desperately wrong with me. Not with my face. Not with my body. Not my family. It's none of these surface level things. But rather, they simply point to a deeper reality. And that's why I believe we experience shame most powerfully in glances, in tones, in body language. Not really with little wor uh, words. Because what what they trigger is something at you within. It's not being imposed by, by it from the outside. My irrational shames, even irrational shames, they assign posts to a true brokenness that exists at the core of my humanity. You see, shame, even irrational shame, points to our fallenness. Self-assertion cannot overcome our fallenness. Only the gospel can put an end to the real root problem of shame. Not by asserting my surface level image, self-worth, and declaring myself free from shame, but by hearing a true word from beyond myself, from beyond my own voice, the true word that says, God loves me, and he pursues me just as I am, and he's done all that is necessary, necessary to save me from my fallenness. And that's why today's passage really is, is so important. It speaks so much to shame. It is what this passage really is about. What we have here in Mark chapter 5, verse 21, to the end of the chapter, and I want to, I want to let you know a little bit about the background. It is an example of a so-called Markan sandwich. 
Now, what is a Markan sandwich? It's a literary device called interclation, which is kind of a, uh, it's kind of like a story within a story. So when you look at this passage, there are really two stories. The first story begins with a desperate man named Jairus begging Jesus on behalf of his dying daughter. But before we find out what happens, you notice that it's interrupted by a second story or another desperate woman seeking healing in verse 25. And then in verse 35, we return to the first story of Jairus and his daughter. And like all other Mark and Sandwiches, by the way, in the a, in a Gospel of Mark, there's several of these, maybe seven or eight, I, I, I don't remember the count, but there's quite a few of them. This is Mark's way of giving us an interpretive context. The way that he puts together is different from the other Gospels, but he wants to give us an input, interpretive context so that the stories, they, they sort of in, interpret one another, okay? Joining us deeper into the core issue at the heart level. And so we'll begin with verse 21. We'll focus on the second story today, on the woman who bleeds. Here's how the first story begins, though, okay? Verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and let your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Now, we're not getting into the story today. All you need to know is the overwhelming sense of urgency. No sooner than Jesus makes land, Jairus, a Jewish leader, throws himself at Jesus' feet. Now think about this. This is not our culture. In the honor-shame culture, in the honor-shame society, he completely ignores the social expectation of dignity that is usually associated with the men in his position. This is a big deal in that society. This tells me this tells me that uh, he has no room whatsoever to worry about face saving because his little girl is dying. And from the Gospel of Luke, this is reported in, in three of the four Gospels, this story. From the Gospel of Luke, we know that this is his only daughter. So what we have here is a desperate, desperate father. It's a scenario that breaks your heart. That word, little daughter, is a diminutive form of the Greek daughter. Provide, it, it provides a verbal link, actually, to the second story. Because Jesus will also call the sick woman daughter in verse 34. And we'll find out later that this daughter of Jairus is 12 years old, just as the woman in the second story has been bleeding for 12 years. And there's one more thematic connection as well. All throughout chapter 5, Jesus is reaching out to the unclean, to the unclean. He frees the Gerasene demoniac from thousands of unclean spirits. He casts the demon into pigs, which are unclean. The woman who bleeds would have also rendered her ceremonially unclean, according to Leviticus. And later, Jesus would touch Jairus' daughter's dead body, which is, of course, unclean. Okay, so that's how all these stories connect one another and begin to interpret one another for us. Now the stage is set, verse 25. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all, she, all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Now, we don't know the precise uh, nature of this woman's medical condition, whether the hemorrhage was uh, uterine, menstrual, or something else. But the point is this, that this is more than just physical ailment at the surface level. This is a problem that touched every part of her life. Now you say, well, how can that be? Well, it touches, think about this, it touches really uh, about her re relationships, her religious life, her physical, emotional, spiritual well-being. How can that be? Well, the subtext goes back to Leviticus. So let me give you a small sample there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read 
Leviticus 15 from the NIV. It's a little bit quicker. And also, uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of, kind of get to the point instead of reading the entire passage. But Leviticus 15, it says this. When a woman has her regular flow of blood, the impurity of her monthly period will last seven days. Anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. Anything she lies on during her period will be unclean. Anything she sits on will be unclean. When a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at the time other than her monthly period, or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge, just as in the days of her period. Any bed she lies on while her discharge continues will be unclean. Anything she sits on will be unclean. Whoever touches them will be unclean. He must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. When she is cleansed from her discharge, she must count off seven days, and after that, she will be ceremonially clean. On the eighth day, she must take two doves or two young pigeons and bring them to the priest at the, at the entrance to the tent of meeting. This means that as long as this woman is bleeding, no one can touch her. She won't be allowed to participate in any social or religious activities. She can't even enter the temple courts, let alone worship there. She is in exile and an outcast among her own family and people. The extent of her suffering is staggering. And you can see that she spent all that she had and grew worse. Now, just in, in case you think this is sexist, it applies to men as well. Okay, the Leviticus 15. Verse 2, when any man has a bodily discharge, the discharge is unclean. When it, uh, whether it flows, it continues flowing his body or is blocked, it will make him unclean. This is how his discharge will bring about uncleanness. Any bed the man with his uh, discharge lies on will be unclean. Anything she, he sits on will be unclean. Anyone who touches his bed must wash his clothes and bathe with water and will be unclean till evening. If the man with the discharge spits on anyone, who is clean, that person must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he'll be unclean till evening. Anything that man sits on when riding will be unclean. Any clay pot that man touches must be broken. Any wooden article is to be rinsed with water. When a man is cleansed from his discharge, he is to count off seven days from his, uh, for his ceremonial cleansing. He must wash his clothes and bathe himself with fresh water, and he will be clean. On the eighth day, he must take two doves, and two young pigeons, and come before the Lord to the entrance to the tent of meeting, and give them to the priest. Now, if this is the first time you've heard of this, let me just say this. You will not, you will not be able to wrap your brain around this whole thing in one go. Okay? You say, why in the world? Why in the world would God give Moses something like this? Well, I want, to, I want to just say this. If, you, if you're approaching the law in general, from this perspective, that the law is so tedious, that it creates nothing but shame and suffering, then you're missing the point. You want to go back to Anselm, who is a theologian from the 11th century. And you want to search more deeply about what he says. He says this, you have not yet considered the weight of you see, the point of Leviticus is not that there is something inherently bad or evil about our bodily discharge, or something inherently good and not so good in the distinction between clean and unclean things, between clean and unclean animals. Now think about this. Lambs and pigs. What's the distinction? God made all things good. Pigs are unclean, not because they're filthy or bad or smelly. Menstruation is unclean, not because it's, it's dirty or immoral or the female body is inferior. But the real reason, the real lesson in all of this points to a deeper reality. The fallenness of humanity and along with it, the brokenness of all creation. The law is not here to create irrational shame or the occasion for social and religious shaming. But it points to the deeper reality, the deeper shame that's already there. 
And the good news is that there is a remedy. There is a way to be purified from defilement. There is a way to wipe the slate clean. There is a cure for the deepest shame. It's not, it's, 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 it's not by more self-assertion. It's not about more self-empowerment. But it's through the sacrificial system that God gave to the Israelites. Therefore, the law is really a good news, bad news kind of thing. The bad news is there is something wrong with me. Not on the surface level, not my weight, or my race, or my education, or my bank account, or my aesthetics, or my body, but in the deepest part of my being, in the marrow of my soul. I have lost the foundation that supports all of my worth and dignity and identity. What is left is shame. See, that's my relationship with God. I lost that. The only connection that truly gives life. And that's why I experience shame so easily. In this sense, all shame points to this shame. No amount of effort and assertion on my part can even begin to compensate for this loss. That's the lower line of the cross shot, by the way. If this is the first time you've seen it, the lower line is the awareness of my sinfulness. The upper line is the holiness, the awareness of God's holiness. And what bridged those two is the love of Christ for me on the cross. I am more broken than I had realized. That's why the, the lower line keeps going deeper. It's, we are more broken than we are aware. I am the living dead. And that's why this woman experienced, uh, he, she is experiencing on a concrete, physical, visceral level every day, this, this sense of shame. The life she lives is no life. So the word she used in verse 28 that ESV translate as may well is literally the Greek word saved. She wants to be saved from this living nightmare. And she believes that Jesus can. In fact, she's so desperate that she's willing to believe that if she just reach out and touches his clothes, that would do the trick. Now, some people think this is rooted in the ancient superstition that the power of the person can be transferred to his clothes. Maybe. But coming from an honor-shame culture, I tend to think that the real point is, this is the way a person in deep shame thinks. This is how they feel. She knows the law. She knows she's unclean. She knows that she's not supposed to touch anybody because it will also make them unclean. Nobody wants that. For 12 years, nobody wants her. So her pain was, uh, her, uh, excuse me, so her plane was, if I just come behind him secretly in the crowd, if I reach out and just touch his clothes, maybe he won't notice. Maybe nobody will notice, so I won't get in trouble. Otherwise, he's going to have to go through the whole rituals, bathing, and ceremonial uh, thing to, to stay, uh, stay unclean until evening. He's going to hate me. And that's the honor-shame instinct. In other words, she's sure Jesus can save her. She's desperate to be saved. But she's not so sure that he will want to because of who she is. She is the definition of shame. This is how a person in shame acts. She moves away from people. She moves away from community and relationships. She just wants to be cured without being known. Honor, shame, instincts. Now watch what happens. Verse 29. And immediately the flow of the blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving himself, that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in a crowd and said, Who touched my garments? Never mind that Jesus doesn't seem to know. Never mind that. This is often used as proof text for Jesus' full humanity. That in his humanity, Jesus doesn't know everything. Maybe. But, I believe the real reason Mark includes this detail is to compare and contrast Jesus' response with his disciples' response. Compare and contrast. Whereas Jesus, realized, he realizes that out of the sea of people that crowd him, press against him, and touch him that day, God the Father has regarded one individual. Out of the many pushing, shoving, grabbing, and touching that day, not every touch brings healing. But God senses power for one person. 
for one touch so light that Jesus didn't even really feel the touch itself, just the fact that power has gone out from him. And he wants to know who that is. He wants to look, look her in the eyes and speak to her. In contrast, his disciples were preoccupied with other things. They couldn't care less. Verse 31. And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? Now that would be my response. <laughs> right? Do you see how many people are here, Jesus? Do you know that we, we can't even move? It's like trying to push your way to a train in the middle of rush hour in Tokyo. Who touched me? Who touched you? Everybody. What kind of question is that? With this many people, who cares? Just a number. Not so with Jesus. He looks for her. He pursues her. Verse, 22, uh, verse 32. And he looked around. See, it's not just like he asked a question. He look around. He look. He look. He look around to see who had done it. But a woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your disease. That word for fear, fear by the way, is the same word that described the disciples' fear. After Jesus calmed the sea. This is Mark chapter 4. She has, uh, it's the same word that described the townspeople's reaction to Jesus casting out demons. Fear. Who then is this? Who is this? Now she has the same experience here. This fear and trembling. Who then is this? Probably mixing with the panicky anxiety of the person who's shamed now being exposed. She just wanted to be cured without being known. Now she's in trouble. But here comes the true word that gives life. Her shame isn't overcome with self-assertion. It isn't overcome with self-declaration. But by a word from outside herself and beyond her own voice. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Not superstition, not magical power of my cloak, but that God has regarded your faith. Now daughter, go in peace and be free from your suffering. And here comes the weight of the Markan sandwich. This is the only occasion in the entire Bible. She's the only woman whom Jesus addresses as daughter. Daughter. And that word echoes precisely the desperate father of the first story. Help me, Jesus. My little daughter is sick. This woman of shame may feel like an exile and an outcast among her own people. She may want to hide from a relationship. She may want to move away from community. But to God the Father, He loves and pursues her, moves towards her wherever she is, not as a number, not as part of the crowd, but as if she is the only daughter. Echoing Jairus' only daughter. It's in that context, Jesus responds by moving towards her. By engaging her, drawing her out of the shame and into community with him. The one who embodies the good news. That's how the gospel put an end to the real root problem, the shame. Isn't that great news? Is this what you have experienced and are experiencing? Don't you wish that some of your neighbor can encounter this true word? Let's pray together. Father, we, we have, we try many things. We have many methods and ideas about how to be saved. How to be saved and be free from this experience of shame. Often we think it's imposed on us by society. Yes, they are irrational shames, we confess, Lord. And they are not good. But all shame points to this shame. That in the court of our humanity, we have been disconnected from you. We thank you that we are not just a number, but that you love us, you pursue us, you regard our faith, and you sent your power out. And I pray that each one of us will come to 
experience this freedom from shame. Not by more self-assertion or self-empowerment, but by hearing a true word that comes from beyond our own voice, the word that gives life. We thank you. We praise you. And may we also take this good news to our neighbors. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.